Random encounters have been an integral part of the Final Fantasy franchise ever since the first entry released in 1987. And much to the chagrin of gamers all around the world, due to the frequency and unknown element of what you might face within, they have often been a point of frustration. You could be walking through a dungeon with supreme confidence, feeling like you've prepared for whatever might be thrown at you, but sometimes the random encounters you'd face would be harder than the boss waiting for you at the end. And after not saving, despite constantly telling yourself you would do on a regular basis, you just hoped to make it through the encounter without seeing the dreaded game over screen. Some games even pushed this fear factor way up by offering up devilish encounter rates to grind you down, while others penalised players for daring to be a bit too curious. And these elements just heighten the sense of unease when venturing towards your end goal. And even though they've since been gracefully removed from the more modern Final Fantasy games, random encounters will always present a degree of dread when venturing back into the franchise's past and the first enemy on our list epitomises that dread to a T. Final Fantasy 1 has some pretty horrible random encounters hidden deep within its dungeons, and the Citadel of Trials was notorious in this regard, thanks to enemies like the Medusa, who could turn your party members to stone. But if you made it through all of these encounters unscathed and powered on, you would end up on the path to face Tiamat at the top of the Flying Fortress. Compared to what came before, this dungeon felt like a breath of fresh air, the maps were a bit smaller and easier to navigate, and the encounters you'd face were pretty reasonable in terms of difficulty. It gave players plenty of confidence heading into the fight against Tiamat, but if you were unlucky, before the fight, you may have ended up squaring off against an even more devilish foe called the Warmech. This enemy, which was also called the Death Machine, could only be encountered on the fifth floor when walking across the very long, narrow bridge but the chances of the encounter occurring were very low. Within the NES version, you would be able to fight Warmech once every 64 fights as the enemy configurations you'd face were pre-calculated with a random order when entering the area, and these would cycle around. It wasn't until the Dawn of Souls version where the encounter was truly random, with the same probability being applied to each separate encounter, making it much more difficult for the Warmech to surface. Nowadays, with the knowledge of Warmech's existence, people go on the hunt to claim Warmech as a trophy, but if you didn't know about this particular enemy, and you happened to be very unlucky with probability, its appearance would be a very nasty shock. Its nuke spell could hit every party member for around 350 damage, and its normal attacks could hit from between 150 to 300 damage. It also regenerated 5% of its HP every round, and it often got a preemptive strike. This meant it was a significant hike up in terms of difficulty compared to anything else faced within the same area, and in the original game, it was on par with the most difficult bosses. But there was a benefit to this fight, because if you managed to encounter Warmech and survive, then you would be granted a huge amount of experience and gill, and in the more modern versions of the game, there is also a chance to get some Genji armor. Within Final Fantasy V, the sealed castle was a place of real significance as it housed the legendary sealed weapons. It also contained shield dragons, which were great for grinding if you wanted a quick level boost. But as you ventured back to acquire more and more of the sealed weapons after the world merged, you would have the chance to face a rather uncomfortable encounter against X Death's soul. This particular enemy had 20,000 health, was immune to all status ailments, and also had very high evasion. But what made it challenging, outside of those initial barriers, was that it would frequently use spells like Death and Banish, along with the Reaper's Sword ability. Due to the nature of these attacks, X Death's Soul could kill a character in one hit, and even though this fate would only befall one of your party members per turn, it was still frustrating nonetheless, and would often lead to a lengthy encounter. The main weakness of X Death's Soul is Holy, but unless you're going for a complete bestiary, it's often advisable to just run away from this particular encounter, as defeating X Death's Soul granted no gill, no experience, and only 7 ability points. It was at least guaranteed to drop Dark Matter though, which could be used to make death potions, but in general, this fight was not worth the suffering. Now some enemies have persisted for almost as long as the franchise has been around, and one such foe is the Marlborough. 
They debuted in Final Fantasy 2, and there were actually four unique variants found within that particular installment. But even though their signature attack was present within the game, it wasn't until Final Fantasy 4 that the Marlboros would gain access to Bad Breath. This particular attack has now become infamous due to how many status effects it inflicts upon the party, and it makes fighting against Marlboros a difficult proposition in almost every game, including the most recent incarnation where the Marlboro appeared in the Shinra Combat Simulator. But if we're looking for the most troublesome, then it has to go to the Marlboros that appeared within Final Fantasy VIII. If you were unfortunate and had explored a bit beyond where you were meant to, they could first be encounters in Esther's Grandidi Forest via Chocobo, but the most common place where you'd encounter this devilish foe was the island closest to heaven and the island closest to hell. These were important locations due to the strength of the magic that could be drawn, so it made sense that Marlboros would be drawn to this, and if you weren't prepared, you would be in for a nasty shock. At level 100, Marlboros have the most HP of any regular enemy found within the game, and what made them challenging outside of that was that Bad Breath would more often than not be used right at the start of every encounter. This would inflict a whole host of status effects that, if not defended against properly, would leave the party in a pretty hot mess and staring down the barrel of a game over. To work around this, you would need to use the junctioning system to become immune to some of the worser status effects such as Sleep, Berserk and Confuse. It also helped to have the initiative ability, as if Quistis was in a critical state, you could use Degenerator to instant kill any Marlboro. Should you get through the fight unscathed though, then you would have the chance to acquire some Marlboro tentacles, and these had quite a lot of utility. Not only could they help you acquire the Doom Train Guardian Force, but they were also required for Quistis to learn the Bad Breath Blue Magic ability and to gain her ultimate weapon, Save the Queen. Now, after Kefka had rained down destruction on the world and sent it into ruin, a whole host of powerful new enemies appeared across the land, and two of the toughest could be found within the Dinosaur Forest. Players who were seeking a challenge were encouraged to seek out the Dinosaur Forest after receiving a cue to do so from thieves in the cave on the Veld. But after venturing there and encountering the Brachiosaur, many would have been left wondering if it was the wisest of moves. Even though the Tyrannosaur, which could also be found in the Dinosaur Forest, was no joke, the Brachiosaur stands as the game's most powerful regular enemy, with stats that rivaled some of the game's strongest bosses. In addition to this powerful base, the Brachiosaur also had an extensive arsenal of moves, and it would start almost every encounter by casting Disaster, which would inflict numerous status ailments and put its aggressors on the back foot. Brachiosaur could then leverage its incredible strength to hit hard with physical attacks, but it could also use Meteor and had a 33% chance of casting Ultima on its fourth turn. Unless you had Re-Raise on, this would likely lead to a game over. But if you could navigate the numerous obstacles by exploiting its weakness to ice, the rewards were worth it. Upon defeat, each Brachiosaur would offer up a significant amount of experience, but they also had the chance of dropping the very rare Celestriad Relic that made all magic spells, lore spells, and esper spells cost only 1 MP. If you were brave enough, there was also a 12.5% chance of stealing a ribbon. Following in the footsteps of the original Final Fantasy, when it came to Final Fantasy II, the developers thought it would be fun to include another nasty surprise towards the end of the game. But unlike Final Fantasy I, where Warmech appeared in the penultimate dungeon, within Final Fantasy II, the nasty surprise appeared in Pandemonium, the game's final dungeon. This was a gruelling dungeon as it was, but as you made your way to the fifth floor, there was a 1.5% chance you could encounter an incredibly difficult foe, the Iron Giant. In addition to having a significant boost in health compared to other enemies within the same vicinity, the Iron Giant also had 180 defense and could use the Poison Cloud 16 attack in addition to its regular physical attacks. This made it a difficult proposition, and such was the size of the task put before players that even though it appeared as a random encounter, the music that played in the background was the boss theme as opposed to the standard battle music. But even if you could withstand the attacks and were aware of its weaknesses to ice and lightning, the Iron Giant had another annoyance, as there was a decent chance it would run away before the fight concluded, leaving your party in ruins and you with nothing to show for your troubles. It meant that if you wanted to try and reap the rewards, which included the chance of gaining some of the best equipment in the game, you would have to slay this enemy as quickly as possible. Aside from the Marlborough, 
There have been many other enemies that have been near permanent fixtures within the roster of enemies, and this list wouldn't feel complete without featuring at least one Tombury. After scouring our roller decks of Chef Knife Pain, we decided that the most heinous appearance of these cute little fellows was within Final Fantasy X-2, as for the first time, we got to square off against the Mega Tonbury. Within the original game, these could be found wandering about the Via Infinito. This meant that within that particular instance, their appearance wasn't random, and part of the challenge was to actually try and make sure you didn't fight against them due to how tough they were. But thanks to the remastered version of Final Fantasy X-2, we can include Megatombris on this list on a technicality. As you progress through the Fiend Arena, the Megatombri will have a random chance to appear as an unfortunate early encounter under the guise of Tombri the Ripper. This was a nasty surprise, and should you have ended up having to square off against this Goliath, then you were in for a bit of a slugfest due to its high agility and extreme attack power. This could see the Mega Tombray defeat most party members in a single hit, unless they had over 16,000 HP and were also equipped with the Iron Duke or Adamantite accessories. On top of that, the Mega Tombray could petrify party members and poison them, doing annoying tick damage. Its Karma ability also drained the target of half its HP and MP. In short, Mega Tombrays were mean and after the catnap strategy was voided for the remaster, taking them down became a lot more tricky. Nonetheless, it was possible with the right setup, and learning to do so in an efficient manner was important, as you could only learn the Cry in the Night blue bullet skill from an oversold Megatonbury. And after talking about the Megatonbury, that brings us onto quite possibly the most horrible random encounter in the history of the franchise, and it appeared in Final Fantasy IX. Exploration has always been an important part of progression within the Final Fantasy games, and within Final Fantasy IX, this was encouraged thanks to the Chocograph system. This tasked players with attempting to find treasure in hidden locations around the world by using a reference picture, and one such Chocograph referred to Fairy Island. This island, also known as Vile Island, was housed between the Forgotten Continent and the Outer Continent, and at first glance it seemed pretty inconspicuous. There was a mountain and a small patch of forest, and getting the chocograph should have been quite straightforward. That was, until you entered into a random encounter and found yourself squaring off against a bunch of sheep called Yan. Compared to many of the other enemies you would have faced, the Yan looked quite harmless, but their appearance was very deceptive. They had incredibly high speed, leading to very fast ATB charges, and they could use Comet, Virus Powder, Float, Error, and Snort. Each of these moves was frustrating in its own right. Snort, for example, would eject a party member from the fight and could lead to a game over if all party members ended up being ejected. And to make matters worse, Yan could even use this as a counter-attack 25% of the time. If encountered in a group, Comet would often be lethal too as it could deal between 99 and 9603 damage to a single target. The only saving grace was that Yan were susceptible to sleep, so the best strategy was to focus on using Queena's Night Spell to put them to sleep and deal with them one on one. Even then though, due to their counter-attacking and speed, Yan were tough and needed to be taken down very quickly. There was of course another variant of Yan that was even tougher, called the Friendly Yan, but that only becomes a pain if you want it to become a pain, as opposed to it being a random occurrence, so we didn't think its inclusion would be that prudent. But either way, that feels like a pretty good place to wrap things up. Now even though these were seven of the hardest random encounters we've faced over the years, there are no doubt many many others that have caused a lot of pain and suffering, and we'd love to hear your thoughts about ones that rained on your parade too. For now though, we hope you really enjoyed this video about some of the more sadistic qualities found in the Final Fantasy franchise, and if you did, then please do consider hitting that like button and subscribing to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.